Welcome to Threads of Enlightenment. As usual, this is my custom here, just to welcome our guest, because I know the guest is coming with several things I deem very expensive. Time, that beautiful commodity, priceless. How you and I utilize the 24 hours that is given to every mankind will tell us a lot about you. You who respect time, who has learned how to cherish it and value it, life becomes different than those who have not. We are privy to see it as well. The other is the journey. The journey housed who we were and made us who we are today. Through much pain, wisdom, laughter, all of the wonderful things, that beautiful mess that gave birth to us. And we want to thank Dr. Uh, Jackson for coming here at Threads of Enlightenment to help us to grow as human spirits while we're here on this planet Earth. Thank you so much, Doc, for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. Thank you for having me, Ken. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. It is an honor. As I said earlier, um, your work, your body of work, I am honored to have you here in our space. And so tell the folks, how do you serve? Because I tell people the ultimate gift, and I invite them to hurry up and get there, is to be a servant. Tell them, how do you serve mankind? First and foremost, I'm a wife and a mother, <laughs> and um, I, I find joy in connecting with humans through relationship. And so um, my circle of, of family, both still my parents and my two sisters, in addition to my kids and husband, really kind of forms the circle of, of my life. Yeah. And I'm fortunate to have a great group of friends that have been friends for a long time. Um, beyond that, I find joy in learning. Yeah. And I love learning about the brain and what makes us tick as humans, what sets us up um, to be in a good mood and, and be productive and what can interfere and have a negative impact on our lives. And so I am a lifelong student. And when I learn something new, I am driven to share that information with, with those around me. And that is awesome. I love that. And you guys are going to be... Um... A surprise at some of the conversation we have because I'm going to pick her brain. Doc, one of the <laughs> um, customs that we do here as well is to go back because I have been educating the audience that uh, one of the space that we visit first as an individual while we're, we've are we landed on this planet, uh, once we've come out of the hospital is home. We call that home. Um, we have mom and dad. Uh, we call them parents. I sometimes call them scientists that are about to uh, experiment on us from their point of view, how they perceive the world with their thesis. Now they are going to put data into you and I. And so invite us to this beautiful um, circle that we call family. What was that like in your situation? I've been incredibly blessed in the family that I was born into. My parents have um, a really healthy, lovely relationship. That doesn't mean that it's free of conflict, yeah. um, but but they work really, really well together. And I grew up in a family. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I have two sisters who I'm very close with. And one of the things that I really appreciate that my parents did in raising me was the freedom to fail yeah. and to try new things. I, I've had some experiences that I don't know that I'd feel comfortable letting my own kids do. When I was <laughs> 18, I went to Alaska for the summer yeah. um, to work in a salmon cannery. So I paid for my first year of college as an 18 year old living across the country, working in a salmon cannery. They were, I, I spent a summer in Russia when I was 16 with a, a travel group without my family. And so they allowed me to push boundaries, to try new things, um, to fail mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and not step in and, and intervene. And Looking back, I can see where it gave me the confidence to know I can step outside this safe circle of home and still carve a path, but home is always there to come back to. Yeah. Um, so I I want to instill those same things in my kids, but it's it's hard and scary to, <laughs> to let them go like that. But I see the value of, of what it gave me where 
they had confidence in me before I had confidence in myself, yeah. which I think led to um, building more confidence in myself and my capabilities. That's a powerful gift that your parents were able to offer you as a young child. Uh, most children are not um, afforded that type of gift and uh, because it does do something to an individual when we are gifted as uh, parents offer these insights. So here you are, this girl with uh, your sisters. What were your relationship with your sisters like? Because you know, siblings always have a wonderful time as they state. So tell us a little about your uh, relationship with your sisters. I'd say the relationship with my sisters in my youth is a 180 from where it is today. <laughs> I'm the oldest of the three girls. And so I was five and nine years older than my sisters. Yeah. And so I was just in such a different place in life than they were. I was in, in second grade when my youngest sister was born. And she'll tell me to this day, she doesn't really remember when I lived at home. Wow. And so by the time she was old enough to really have day-to-day -day memories, I was in college. Yeah. Um, our family, one of the things that my parents found was when our family went skiing together, that was the one activity that all of us could do together, even at different ages and stages. Yeah. And so a, a family ski trip is not a cheap yeah. <laughs> trip. So it wasn't something that we did often. Um, but every couple of years they would, they would try to pull us together for that. And so um, my sisters were just sort of there. Um, and, but, you know, I, I was going a million miles a minute in, in 12 different directions. And so it really wasn't until I was an adult yeah. um, that I really, truly got to know them on a personal level. And we live all across the country from each other and, and don't necessarily talk daily. Um, but even even when I was in, in college and as a, a young adult, I never turned my phone on silent. I always kept my phone next to my bed. And it was because if one of my sisters needed something in the middle of the night, they knew no matter what they, they could call. So we have this gift of always being there for each other. If, if anyone needed anything, we would drop everything. Um, our parents really instilled in us that servant attitude of yeah. family, family first. life. And yeah. And, and so even though we don't talk daily, you just you know that that foundation is there and they're the first to, to um, call to celebrate when something positive is happening or to be by your side um, during other times. Yeah, that is awesome. I, I love to hear those stories with family, um, have that closeness. Uh, I know that my family, my brothers and sisters, there are five of us and we are similar. We are always there when needed uh, for each other. So here you are, this uh, girl, and I love the theme that I am this thread that I'm picking up is that you were always busy. So here you were always busy as this young girl moving through. You're in high school and you're looking to college. Why did you pick the road that you picked that, uh, and what was it that pulled you towards um, the field that you, you took and studied in college? What happened there and what was that like that caused you to head in that direction? I, I didn't always know what I wanted to do, but from a young age, science and anatomy fascinated me. When I was in third grade, I learned that you could stand on your head and in spite of gravity, you could still swallow. <laughs> and it was because of the peristaltic waves of the esophagus. I thought that was really neat. Um, so I, I always had a fascination there, um, but I didn't like hospitals. Yeah. I didn't like the smell. I find them to be freezing cold. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. don't like blood. Um, and so in the back of my head, I knew that I was interested in the human body. But it, to me, med school was never an option because I didn't want to spend time in a hospital. And so I explored other areas of, of you know, did I want to be a journalist? I, yeah. I enjoy writing. Um, did I want to do something with the news? But ultimately, um, I had an experience. My grandmother had a stroke when I was in 10th grade, and my grandmother was a university professor. Mm -hmm. So she started the child psychology department at Mankato State University. So uh -huh. a, a forward woman in her yeah. time. So in the, the 1950s, she was a single mom who was a, um, a professor and a professional. Um, so she was a great example to me of, I never had to be told that women can do things yeah. To me, it just, it just was. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so 
she had a stroke um, and then started a series of three years where she was really in a hospital or a long care, long term care facility. And I didn't like what I was seeing. Obviously, it was emotional. It was hard to see somebody that you loved and care about change and go through um, what she went through. Yeah. But I watched this cascade of she would be prescribed one medication for symptoms. And then that medication would create other symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I just watched this layering of layering one medication on after another. And I didn't know what to do different. Um, but I knew that I wasn't loving what I was seeing. Yeah. So then fast forward years later, I have um, a, a distant cousin who's a chiropractor and I visited his practice. He worked with his wife and I walked in and it smelled good. It wasn't freezing <laughs> cold. It didn't smell like chemicals. Um, and I saw the relationship they had with their patients where they yeah. would come in and it was, you know, big hugs. I haven't seen you in a month. Tell me about yeah, your kids, yeah. what's going on. And at that point, you know, my awareness of chiropractic was back pain, neck pain. I had seen a chiropractor, <laughs> yeah. you know, when I had a back issue, but listening to them, it was really an environment of wellness. Yeah. What can we do to support health and well-being going forward? And I loved that. It, it just, it really resonated with me of um, prevention mm -hmm. and a whole lifestyle, not just treating a symptom. Yeah. So that was what what um, triggered my interest in, in going to chiropractic school. Yeah, it's um, fascinating with because um, your story is similar to my mom. My mom had um, she went for an operation. They the physician made a mistake, and um, she went into she died. Went into a coma. The rest they finally got her. I think she was. She was out for a while, and um, as you know, I grew up, I was in the hospital system. You can't, you have to resurrect that person before you can move them out of that room. And so they they did what they did, and they put her, and she was in a coma for, for a while. And when she came out, she had to go to a nursing home, and I got into that business, skilled nursing facility. One of the things that I noticed with my mother is just like you with medication and so forth, and I was a director of marketing and, and admissions and so forth. And so I was responsible for recruiting the physicians and so forth that came in, medical directors. And so forth. I sat down with, because I, I'm curious as you are, and um, I studied a lot of the medicine and re interactions because of my mom. And I saw a pattern with my mother and um, being in a nursing home, and I would address the the um, I would go to the nurse manager and I would say to her, hey, we need to do something about this. And what I did with my medical director was I make sure that he had a team that would reconcile medication with every single patient that is in that facility. And I had, we came up with a plan whereby we did that often. Any new changes in medication we would have to reconcile it because I saw, as you stated, the side effects uh, caused by one on top of the other. And uh, that population is so vulnerable that we need to be even more astute at uh, how we take care of to that level. And so I would not sign a contract with anyone, Doc, unless I saw that aspect of their ability to reconcile medication because, as you stated, it, it co can cause tremendous amount of um, uh, pain and unnecessary suffering for it, the patient. So here you are, you had a, a, this exposure to the chiropractor office, it's clean, doesn't smell, the relationship aspect of it, and you decided at that point, I want to be a chiropractor. You got that decision. Now, I always tell people that's one of the keys to success. One must make a decision. Until then, we're just drifting along. We're not sure. But once we made that decision, what happens is that the mind begins to do a wonderful trick. It begins to seek out information, data, to make this a reality. When you made that decision, um, how did you feel um, not knowing that you're going to a place that is in your mind, no smell, 
but I'm going to get my office and build my relationship. How was that? How did you feel in your skin when you started making and walking towards that? Well, I, I'm going to back it up even one step further before that. And, and this was just something that I had always had in the back of my head. And I was in high school. My dad was driving me to school in the morning and we were listening to talk radio. Yeah. And the, the gentleman talking made the comment, um, and this was talking specifically about Americans. And he said that 80% of Americans hate their job. Yeah. And I remember that statement and thinking, here I am in high school about to go on to, to study something more and get ready for the rest of my life. Yeah. And you're telling me that the majority of the population <laughs> is miserable. <laughs> and, and that just, I mean, that hit me like a lightning bolt. And so yeah. I think for me in that, what do I want to do next? Where do I want to study? What do I want to do? I was driven by that statement of yeah. how do I ensure that I love what I'm going to do. We spend a lot of time of our life at work. Yeah. And so doing something that that triggers my joy and passion was absolutely just a fundamental aspect of that decision for me. So um so I think you know there's a lot of things that I could have chosen to do but it it needed to trigger for me that that joy and passion. And I'll never forget sitting in one of my first classes in chiropractic school and um, it was anatomy. Mm -hmm. And sitting in that class and, you know, this is after undergrad where I had, you know, I loved, I loved college. I loved learning, yeah. but sitting in that class and knowing that what I was learning in that class, I was actually going to use yeah. every day going forward was just this feeling of excitement and relief mm -hmm. where I had learned a lot of interesting, fascinating things, but, you know, I wasn't going to use the math that I was learning on a daily basis. I wasn't going to use um, so much of what I had learned. And so to know that it, it just, it gave all the classes more, a greater importance. I needed to pay attention because this information might potentially help a patient, or if I didn't listen, it yeah, might hurt yeah. a patient down <laughs> the road. And so it gave the learning heightened experience of importance, knowing that I was going to be using this information all along. Yeah. But it also, uh, enforced with that, uh, young girl, that little girl, uh, was fascinated with the anatomy. And so she is getting to be, if you will, in her playground um, to really getting a chance to go deeper into the knowledge of one's body. So as you are studying and bringing in all of this knowledge into your world, I know when you are in that space, it kind of makes you aware of your body. As you are gaining knowledge, um, Doc, and you are this young woman that is always moving and, and what did you begin to notice with you? How were, how were you in that space? You were happy, but what was your thought patterns like as you were getting up and moving through your day? When I learned something new that I think is important, I want, I want to share all of the information. So I yeah. think I drove my family and sisters <laughs> absolutely nuts. And that, that youth of, I learned something new and I think I know it all. So I'm going to tell everybody. Yeah, um, yeah. And so I needed to learn that not everybody was as excited <laughs> about the information as I was <laughs> and that, um, lifestyle and how we live are, are big and very personal decisions. Yeah. And so I would learn this information and, so um, there was a lot of nutrition um, woven throughout the program. And so I, yeah. I changed very much how I ate to the point where my family would say, oh, what class are you taking now? How is this going to impact us? <laughs> um, and so changing the way I ate, my awareness of you know, exercise and, and balance in life and spending time in, in nature. Um, but not everybody is ready for the information that you have. And so... Yeah learning to wait until somebody asks for the information was hard for me. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, you know, people need to be in a place where they're interested and ready to receive the information. Otherwise it's just noise. Yeah. I, I tell them, um, I grew up in church and Jesus said something that always troubled me. Those who have ears, let them hear. And so you have to be listening with something else than just your natural ears. And so if you're not ready for it, it means that statement, as I began to gain insight into it, there is an onus on the hearer to be ready. And um, 
there's a responsibility there for those that, um, and I always tell them, and the listeners on my podcast, I always tell them, remember, it's good to listen, but try to transition into becoming a hearer. A hero is the people that it will affect. It will change them. It will cause an effect will happen when you hear something. Um, and when you it lands into you, like you were talking about that story, that uh, you're in the car with your dad and this uh, gentleman said something, you switch from a listener to a hearer in a second. And that hearing guided your life in how you wanted to um, achieve something. And I always tell people, me, make that switch because your life will change. So here you are, you're having a great time, you're giving the information, you're getting it. And the reason why I'd ask you that question about what did you do? Because you're having all this information and I know that they talk about nutrition, I know they talk about all of that. And I wanted to see how did you uh, uh, take that information into you and how did you manage your life? And as you mentioned, it began to you began to use it to the fact where your people around you, your family, oh my God, what class you got in now? So here you are, you have graduated. You are now looking at getting a place from school. And of course, there's no smell. Um, talk to us about your achievement after you got your paper. And you're there, Doc, and you're standing there with this achievement that you have earned um, with all your hard work. What were you thinking about at that moment when you got it? That's such a humbling moment where in that moment you feel like you're there. You've you've worked, you know, eight years of, of college and grad school and you've achieved this piece of paper and you are ready to tackle the world. And then in that moment, you realize how much you still have to learn. Yeah. <laughs> For, you know, you've got a book of knowledge, but no practical application of it. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was fortunate where um, I began as a chiropractor and I rented space um, in another practice. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized how little I knew about the business side of things yeah. of, I can't help and serve if I don't have patience yeah. and there it's an art to reaching people. And so I'm um, learning that I can only be effective if I'm able to connect with people yeah. on what it is that they're looking for. Um, so I, I, it was the learning the business side of things that I wasn't anticipating, but I saw that I couldn't be effective without, without that aspect that hadn't been the aspect that I was excited about. Um, and ultimately I realized, um, I wanted to have my own practice, my own space. And I was so fortunate with the mentor I had in my first practice. So I learned so much so quickly, yeah. um, and had support to be able to do that. And at that time in my life, I was young. I had just turned 25 and, um, I moved back to Minnesota mm -hmm. and the, the space that I was in at this time was downtown Minneapolis in the Minneapolis Skyway system. And it was in connection with a gym yeah. and this gym had a boxing facility. And so who I was surrounded with were young professionals that were athletes and physical. Yeah. So that's who my patient population became were people in a similar age and stage of life as me. And, and then I got to grow with these people for years. Yeah. And so that started to guide me in a different direction where when my patients started to get married and started to have kids, I realized, oh my gosh, I need to know more about <laughs> um, pregnancy care um, yeah. for chiropractic. And then I need to know more about pediatrics. And so that ultimately <laughs> started to lead me down the path to, to my work and, and passion with kids and development. And it was because I needed to keep up with, with the patients in my life. And as their lives were changing, I needed to, to learn more to support them. Yeah, that's fascinating. I wanted to know, how did you pivot to where you are today? How did that come about? Because as we stated, the journey is very interesting to me. How did one end up where they did? And you explained it was you saw this need um, as your patients were expanding in their life. You saw a need for data information that you began to study and, and in collecting that 
uh, information so that you can adjust to the expanding uh, needs of your your clients, you began to move and gravitate to another area. So as you are gravitating to that area, what was it that was pulling at you when you began to look at that data? What was it that began to say, come on, Doc, come on, Doc, I, I need you in this uh, area? What was it that you saw? I started to see a trend that made me uncomfortable. I think so often we learn from the hard things in life. Yeah. And I saw a trend and pattern. And, and again, at this time, I wasn't a mom yet myself. Mm -hmm. um, or And so was just observing. And there were a couple moms in a row that I saw that had concerns about their infant or toddler. And they were being brushed off. Oh, mom they'll grow out of it. Don't yeah. worry. They'll be fine. He's just a boy. And I watched these moms who were scared and stressed and worried and knew something was off mm -hmm. or different, but didn't know where to go or what to do about it. And at that time, I assumed that, you know, you'd go to your pediatrician and if there was a concern, they would diagnose it early. And I thought that if you had a diagnosis, it would provide you with a here's what to do. And I, I started to realize that's not always the case yeah. is even when a parent receives a diagnosis such as autism or dyslexia or ADHD for a child, there's not a clear cut path and parents end up needing to find answers and resources on their own. And that's when the child gets diagnosed. So we know mm -hmm. that the average child doesn't get diagnosed with dyslexia until after three years of struggle in elementary school. Um, it, so there's there's a long road of, of challenge and certainty yeah. and stress and worry before that step. And that step doesn't always provide what you think it's going to. And so that was in the back of my head where I was watching this, but again, I didn't understand it. I didn't know what to do different, but it it, it was standing out in my memory and I was starting to see this as a trend. And then when mm -hmm. my husband and I um, were pregnant with our first child, this was coinciding with us moving across the country for my husband's job. So I had decided yeah. to sell my chiropractic practice so that I could be a stay at home mom. And as we were moving and so we were able to do that and we moved from Minnesota to North Carolina and I found myself missing learning. I, I needed yeah. stimulation. And so I started taking more courses in um, neurology and the neurology of development. And there was one particular course and it was the neurology of dyslexia. And I called my husband, he had been traveling and I said, Doug, you're dyslexic. And he said, no, I'm not. And his dad was in the car with him and his dad spoke up and said, oh, that's right. You are. And um, his parents had him diagnosed when he was very young. And they made yeah. the decision not to tell him. He's very intelligent. <laughs> He's a very hard worker. And then his mom passed away. And I think his dad forgot over the years. Um, and so Doug came And home. here comes his wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he also struggles with auditory processing. Uh, yeah. But he came home that weekend. And I had been learning all of this information about the brain. And yeah. my mom is an elementary school psychologist. I would call her every day after class and say, Mom, what are the schools doing about this? When a child is struggling to control their behavior, struggling to um, stay on task in, in school, and she would talk about the behavior intervention plans. And what she was describing was putting a bandaid on symptoms, on yeah. putting modifications in place, but not creating change. And I was listening to all this information about the power of the brain and when networks haven't developed the way they're supposed to, why it makes things harder for you and the knowledge that the brain can change. We can exercise yeah. the brain the way we exercise the body. And when we do that, it can minimize the downstream complications. And so my husband came home from that trip and I sat down and said, I've got a new life plan. Just listen, <laughs> hear me out. And I just, I felt like this information was, so important. And this was as we had a young child is knowing that my husband has dyslexia, there was a high likelihood that one or more of our kids would. And his response to me was, 
if we can help our kids now so they don't have to put in the extra work and face the challenges that I did, wouldn't that be nice? And so I yeah. felt like I can't wait till my kids are school age to go back to work. We have so many kids and families struggling and, and life is struggle. There's, there's, it's not that there's anything wrong with struggle, but if there's things that we can do so that child can be more successful in who they are as a person, that enhances who they are rather than taking away and putting unnecessary hurdles in their place. So uh, that's how I transitioned from chiropractic and stay at home mom <laughs> to then working with the brain and development and ultimately working with brain balance. Yeah, that's a beautiful, I love your story, how you, how you pivoted and it was a natural um, shift, if you will, in uh, how you're moving and from your, the beginning of your, um, from home uh, to where you are telling that story as that day, you see that that's uh, natural um, stream moving through your life, which is really interesting and beautiful. So here you are, you, you've I've made your announcement to your husband, you began your studies. And um, we talked briefly about the uh, situation with uh, that particular diagnosis back in the 90s. Um, it was such a stigma within families and caused much disrupt, disruption and labeling of children, and much damage uh, happened in people's lives as a result of that particular way by which how um, medicine handled it back then, because I remember, I'm, I remember. Okay. So here you are, you're studying and you're noticing certain uh, trends, if you will, and you have the opportunity to talk with your mom, which is giving you some insights and seeing this tremendous need and um, seeing that need and knowing of it, how did it, um, what did it do to you with your studies? Because I know it from listening to you, I can see what it would do, but I wanted to hear what you, you, what it did, having that information from mom and you are looking at all this data, a newness, a new approach. Yeah. It, it lit a fire in me of needing and wanting to understand more and what can we do to empower families to support and help their kids. And to me, it's really important. And I know I referenced labels and diagnosis earlier, but to me, it's actually really important to strip the label and diagnosis away to understand the person in front of you. When we put a label yeah. or diagnosis on, it's often seen first. And while that it can provide information, it can provide services for support. But when we talk about something like attention, attention is not unique to ADHD. Somebody that's struggling with anxiety, with depression, with sensory processing, with autism, with dyslexia also has an impact on attention. So as soon as we talk about something as ADHD, we see it as that silo of one thing. But attention is something mm -hmm. that we all use on a daily basis. And in fact, if you or I were exhausted or hungry or stressed, we would also struggle with aspects of attention in that moment. And so to yeah. me, it's understanding the bigger picture of how development happens that that provides us with these skills and abilities and when and if development goes off track, how it can complicate what should have come together. But more importantly than that, what can I do to support my skills and abilities on a daily basis? And then for my kids, what can I do to build towards strengthening networks and pathways in the brain so they get to be the person they are without complications in their way? And so my brain always wants to understand the why. Um, yeah. So, in, and to me, neurology is magic. It is fascinating. The more I learn about it, the less I feel like I know. But it gives me a concrete explanation for, you know, this isn't a bad kid, the eight-year-old sitting in the, the third grade classroom that needs constant redirection. This is a child whose brain and body are functioning different. He's brilliant. He's funny. He's charismatic. And we're calling his name out in class over and over and over again. So now we're sending the message that there's something wrong with you. But that is a child whose networks and pathways in the brain are wired for high energy. He needs movement to pay attention or she. And, mm -hmm. and there's gifts and abilities that come along with that. But we're set up in a way that we tell kids you need to sit still to pay attention. 
That's true for some brains. That's not true for all brains. So understanding how the brain develops, what we can do to support development, um, because what I see is when there's a complication, there's a lot of internalized emotion of what's wrong with me. Why is this harder for me than it is for other people? I know I'm smart, but, um, and so wanting to know what we can do to strengthen networks and pathways to support the individual. Yeah, that's some powerful information because those are the issues that that individual will struggle with in their life and will cause them to act and think and believe certain things, the less than um, that they begin to program themselves. I am, I am this, I am that. And they hear it, of course, from the teachers and the outsiders that are um, uh, depositing those hurtful words uh, into that individual. And that individual hearing all of those words, they once they accept it, it now becomes a lifestyle. And once it comes to that aspect, it is a, as someone like you, you now have to come in and reprogram the mind, the belief system, the, that mechanism that they now took ownership of. You have to teach them how to relinquish that and teach them how beautiful they are to allow them to relinquish that because most of them hold on to it because it's, that's what they think they, they are. And so um, when you began to notice talk and you began to study the brain, you saw the data, you saw behavior with the data, how behavior forms, the redesigning um, uh, of the mind and all of those things. As you began to notice that and you began to see that there is a way by which you can put into a a format or a program, for lack of a better word, a process, you know, let's say that, a process by which now you can take a believer in the negative uh, words to escort them into this new behavior, new mindset. When you started noticing that, how did you put it into that process uh, to begin to be utilized by individuals? I learned that from the parents that I worked with. So we would be working with these kids in center and, you know, through sensory stimulation and physical activity and coordinated eye movements, we would be exercising and strengthening the brain. And the parents were coming to us saying, you know, my, my child's 10 and has never been able to ride a bike and they're riding a bike. Now they're able to tie their shoes. To me, the stories that always hit me the most were the, the personal ones with friendships and relationships. When you have a fifth grader yeah. that, you know, the neighbors come and ask the siblings to play, but your fifth graders never asked to play. And suddenly they're invited on a play date and invited back a second time. Yeah. Um, so it was the parents telling me the stories of, when we exercised the brain, doing what it is that we do at Brain Balance, they were telling me the changes. And that to me showed us we had this opportunity to teach the kids who they are in that sitting down and having that conversation of, do you remember when tying your shoes was so hard or when you weren't able to ride that bike? tell me what you just did. And so when the kids were able to say, I can do that now, things that used to be hard for me, I can do now. That was our opportunity to show them your brain is stronger now. The things that were yeah. hard for you before are different and and you can do hard things and there's always going to be hard things in life, but your brain is stronger now. And so it was, I wanted to flip a switch in the kids so that to, to help with those self-limiting beliefs of you can push through, you can do hard things now. And it was the changes that, that were occurring daily that, that helped that. So how that ultimately impacts kids, I think we'd have to you know talk to them 10 years later. Um, but dear yeah. friends of ours, um, their son did the Brain Balance Program in third grade. He had been a struggling reader um, and was years behind in reading. And he's now a, a junior in college and talking to him a few years back, he doesn't remember the years where he was a struggling reader. He remembers doing brain balance and he knows that he did brain balance to help with his attention and reading, but he only remembers the success 
of, yeah. it, it, you know, he, he did great throughout school going forward. So that to me was beautiful. And that's, it, it's wonderful to know that the brain can change at any age and we can help and support yeah. and strengthen at any age. But boy, do I love doing it at a young age before those beliefs <laughs> in yourself are set in stone. Yeah. So, you know, Jackson yeah. now only sees himself as capable and doesn't have memories of the years of tears and frustration sitting at the kitchen table working on phonics and, and <laughs> sight words with his mom. Yeah, that is a beautiful thing to have the young ones learn the principles of growth, if you will, at a young age. They will become masters way before uh, we would even know it. But I want to regress a little because I want to go back and talk about the genesis of brain balance. How did that come about? Because that is an important piece of, uh, of you that was given birth as a result of that journey that you took. How did that genesis begin, Doc? Um, what sparked it to cause you to go and said, okay, let's put this together? Sure. So I was not the founder of Brain Balance. I'm not the one that, that built or designed the original program. Yeah. And it, it came from an individual who had been working with patients who had stroke or brain injury. And he started to see these trends and patterns where if there's an injury in a particular area, it can present like somebody that has ADHD. I saw that in my grandmother mm -hmm. who had the stroke. After she had the stroke, she was a college professor who would now swear and talk about inappropriate things in front of the kids. She lost her break and filter. And, and, yeah. and so what was seen is some of the cutting edge forward thinking approaches that they were using in rehabilitation was mm -hmm. rebuilding and strengthening or building new pathways in the brain. And so it was applying that concept to development. The kids that we work with aren't broken. There's nothing wrong with them, but we have an opportunity to strengthen pathways. And so doing this, not through the use of, of medication, but through sensory stimulation, cognitive activities, eye exercises, we're able to do a very specialized exercise training program for the brain that, that helps to strengthen. And I, I want to be clear, I have such love and respect for modern medicine. It is yeah. So I, I never want to put that down, but I also want families to know there is a time and place for medication. And if medication is helping your child, that's wonderful. Far too many families, it hasn't been the help and they're still left struggling and looking for answers. And so in knowing that there's more options. So I wasn't the founder of the program, but was fortunate enough to be able to join the program really in the infancy of the company. And my husband and I owned yeah. and ran three centers for a decade. And with a change in leadership at the company, um, I was asked to join the home office executive team to really start to evolve and update the program, build new programs and yeah. do research to say, okay, what we're doing is working, but, but why? <laughs> what is it about what yeah, we're doing? Yeah. And, and quantify those results. Yeah, that is awesome. I um, because I know that is a great part of you, and I wanted to go into that and allow because I told told, told Doc that my granddaughter swears, <laughs> she swears <laughs> that I suffer. <laughs> you know, she's like, Papa, I know it, I know it, and I said, Well, maybe you can diagnose me, but I think I am. But um, it is. One of the things, because I said I had a single dad with my boys and I saw because I kept getting all the information from school concerning my children and um, I had to find another way and I did. And um, I back when I started that time, I used to meditate with a lot. And so it was amazing. I would meditate with my boys and, and um, uh, parts of that, how my approach out of nothing, I just didn't know. I just didn't. As you said, I, I, medicine has its place. It has kept many alive. It kept me alive, you know. So um, there also a time that um, one must seek other um, disciplines and alternative disciplines out there. There are many uh, that even uh, conventional um, medicine, medicine and uh, are recognizing some of them chiropractic, um, those, you guys, I fought for, and I had signed contracts with, uh, chiropractic 
organizations to be a part of our HMOs. Uh, people were telling me I, I used to think strangely because I knew the importance of chiropractic within um, uh, the wellness mentality and what you do. And uh, coupled, my goal was to have that coupled with a general practitioner so that uh, that partnership between those two would be able, because I knew the system would not allow the uh, chiropractor to be the general practitioner. So I had to, I was fighting to have that partnership so that uh, people, because I saw what it did for me as my family, and uh, I was trying to do that with others. So here you are, and, and you guys that are listening, Doc has a book back on track. I want you to buy this book. This book deals with um, processes by which one can be guided, and I'm going to let her talk a little about that so she can give you some pointers for it. You know how I feel about a book. I tell people it is a private one-on-one -on -one, um, conversation that you're having with the author. And when you place yourself in that space, you, you would be amazed at how you would receive more when you find yourself sitting down, you're resting, the mind is beginning to come to a space by which it is going to open and allow information in that is the space of rest. When one is there, uh, the brain wave, the theta brain kicks in, all of those things will um, allow you to uh, drink information and data so that you can change your life. Talk, talk to them a little about that book and um, the from the data that you guys uh, had uh, collected because you were in this particular space collecting data with all this family and how it was able to uh, pers uh, help you to provide this process so that families can buy this book and bring it into their homes. Whereas you, if you don't have a, a facility close by, you, this book is able to be that um, facility to help you with. To talk to them about that book. As we were collecting data as a company and, and analyzing that data, the message to me was just hopeful and exciting, is what we saw was yeah. change is possible. As we exercise and strengthen the brain, you see a decrease in struggles with inattention. You see a decrease in hyperactivity and impulsivity. You see improvements yeah. in the ability to manage mood and emotions and anxiety. So you see an increase in overall well-being. And to be able to see this on a massive scale, at Brain Balance, we've assessed over 150,000 individuals. We've got pre and post data on, on tens of thousands of, of kids um, and are getting more information, learning more and more about the adult brain. Um, yeah. So to have this information, to be able to quantify change was taking place, not just in the data, not just in measurements of gross motor and developmental milestones and cognition, but that change was translating over into real life. So having teacher reported improvements in attention and classroom behaviors, having clinician reported improvements, having improvements reported from the parent perspective, and then also measurable change and improvement. And so to be able to see the whole child, whole life impact of a stronger, faster, more efficient brain is just to me hopeful and it, the the book was really written during the pandemic we saw an escalation of concerns and challenges in both kids yeah. and adults and taking a step back to say why what happened during those few years where life changed dramatically for a period of time that had such an impact and when we changed our sensory exposure, when we changed the way we interacted with others, there was a very real impact on the development of our kids and on our adult brains. And hopefully yeah. we'll never live through another pandemic, but we will face future times of stress and change. So I wanted to arm people with the knowledge of what is it that I can do on a daily basis for my brain or my child's brain to set them up for success each and every day? What can we do daily to support the lifestyle for a healthy brain? And then if a child has veered off track or you just want to optimize development, what can be done 
to exercise the networks and pathways in the brain to help. And so to me, the book is a starting point for all kids. It's accessible to everyone. As you said, even if you don't have a center nearby or a program isn't accessible, uh, but it's also important to note brain balance. We do have centers all across the U.S., but we also have a virtual program. So we work with families all around the world um, that you get to work directly um, with a live brain balance coach weekly. So we do want to be able to, to meet people where they're at and help them on their journey. Um, but to me, the book Back on Track is a tool to provide parents with information of here's what to watch for to know your child is on track at all ages from birth through 18. And here are actionable things that you can work into daily life that are powerful, but simple things that can have a real um, impact on the brain and development. And those, uh, I know Doc has also programs for adults that are out there um, for the ADHD. I, as I said, my mind is all over the place. And um, uh, Doc, I, I think uh, there's something you guys may need to study me because I can, um, uh, I can listen to um, a program or something and I read uh, and I'm listening to a podcast and I'm reading an article and I'm doing something and I know exactly what it is. Someone will say, you can't, no, you can't. And I would say, yeah. And I tell them, pick which platform you want, ask me a question and they would, and I'd tell them exactly what it is. And so my mind is all over the place. And so that's why my granddaughter says, you are, you, you got that, that, Papa. Uh, so all you adults that, uh, because I know that um, you can be suffering from the less than thoughts and um, you need tools uh, to help your mind. It's all about the mind. And um, Duncan mentioned the data that they have, the, um, the enormous amount of data that, can, that has been uh, collected and there is proof that it works. And knowing that alone, I wanna challenge you guys. I'm gonna provide you with everything for Doc because I know the statistics back in the 90s and with the, the pandemic came in, it, it came back up even more because I was looking at some of the data. I have uh, my eyes on those data in healthcare because that's where I'm from. And the, um, uh, this need, this underlying care within Western civilization is prominent when it comes to this. And I have someone, guys, I am so glad that she is here. I cannot even tell you because I know what this is about. And there is an alternative to the um, to Adderall and all the different things. There is, um, I was reading an article uh, before Doc came on about it. The, um, uh, the decrease in the medication of uh, Adderall, that's how, um, how it is being overprescribed that you are running out of it. That is amazing to me, knowing how much that industry makes and produces. That alone is troubling, and it should trouble you, that there is a shortage of that. That means that there is great gross misuse within that industry. And so I have someone that have an alternative, but this alternative got data <laughs> and the data will show you some things that you need to be aware of. Talk, tell, talk to them as, because I see you may want to interject something. Talk you to know, I, I just wanted to point out, you know, you talked about your mind being all over the place and, and the things that you can do. There are gifts that can come along with ADHD as well. This is, we look at it as such, such a negative and there are a lot of tough yeah. consequences. And something we get as a question from parents all the time is they're worried that if they strengthen the immaturities that are complicating things, that they're going to take away from their child's gifts. I think there's a fear yeah. of not wanting to accept my child just as they are and who they are. And I really want to give a different perspective to that of your gifts are your gifts and strengthening other yeah. areas of the brain isn't going to diminish the gifts. Yeah. The strengths are yeah. there and the strengths will always be there. And we do know that 
in an individual with ADHD, there's really, really strong connections in the parts of the brain that do creative thinking, that do brainstorming. But again, by strengthening the areas that are challenges, it's not going to take away from the strengths. We just get to minimize some of the complications, um, which is a, you, you get to be the beautiful person that you are meant to be, and we just work to reduce some of the complications. That's excellent. I want to, I love because I know you had such um, opportunities to see this, that I want you to give us a glimpse of it. Um, a family member that, uh, not a family member, one of your, your clients and a family, a mom, that has been troubled for so many years with the information given from other sources about her child. And they were able to come in to under your guidance. And from being there, they were able to um, see the change in that child. Invite us to one of those and the joy that that mother uh, parent had when that child, and even the child, when they were able to make the transition from one space to another. Invite us to one of those beautiful, um, I call them the enchanted moments. Yeah so that we can get a chance to glimpse what happened when you had an opportunity to uh, uh, use that process, if you will. Sure. And as you were describing the, the family that came to my mind, <clears throat> this isn't the most dramatic story. It's not the most profound, but it's the one that, that came to my mind when you brought this up. Um, the mom's name was Melissa, and I have permission to, to share the story um, from writing the book. And this family has five kids and they um, had lived in the same house for years and years and years. And this was the example of the fifth grader where, you know, all the all the kids would come to the door, but never wanted to play with Josh. And um, if Josh did yeah. join the group, it wouldn't last long. He'd usually come stomping back in frustrated and upset um, of so and so, you know, wasn't playing the game the right way or, or whatever the frustration was. Um, and there were complications in several areas. So they would frequently get phone calls from school of Josh needed more redirection to stay on task. His name was the name that was called out often in the classroom. He's a brilliant, brilliant boy, but was struggling as school went further along. He was struggling on the comprehension side of things. Um, yeah. And the family didn't want to go the route of a diagnosis or medication. And they had done counseling, they had done OT, they had done the services that they knew to do and were just feeling stuck. And again, nothing was terribly wrong, but there was a lot where the mom just felt like she was yelling at her son all the time, um, where he was, you know, you'd get into arguments and the way siblings do, but even more so. And his frustrations and upsets were, he seemed often younger than some of the younger siblings, even though he was a, a very yeah. tall, gangly fifth grader. And when we met with Josh and did his assessment, the mom was right. He was a very, very intelligent boy, but there were many aspects of development that were multiple years behind. So we had this 10 year old yeah. that in some ways had working memory of a 12 year old, but then in other areas of development might've been more in line with the six year old. And so the way he handled himself when he was frustrated and upset, his ability to stay on task was more in line with, with a six-year-old. So I always picture yeah. what would that look like if we put a first grader in a fifth grade classroom and asked them to stay on task, to interact with their peers and to learn. Yeah. They could do it, but it's gonna require a lot of additional support. Um, and as they started going through the program, um, you know, they, they started to notice little differences and changes. Josh, after the Christmas break, came up to me and told me that he had reread the Harry Potter series over vacation. <laughs> and if you're familiar with the books, wow. they're enormous. Yeah, they're enormous. And, yeah. and he told me he had read them before, but he said it was like he was reading them for the first time. He was able to pay attention wow. and follow along with the story in a way that he couldn't previously. And so he understood it mm -hmm. at a different level and, yeah. and fell in love with the books all over again. Um, but it was the mom, Melissa, came in months later into my office and she was in tears. She was upset. And she had just found out that their, um, her husband had just gotten a different job and their family was going to need to move. And so I was listening, trying to understand where the upset was coming from. And she said, you don't understand. For the first time, we've lived in this neighborhood our whole lives. For the first time, Josh has friends in the neighborhood. 
And we can't, we can't leave that. Kids are coming to the door asking him to play and he's getting along. He's not melting down. He's able to stay out and enjoy time with friends. And, you know, after 10 years, we finally have this, we, we can't leave that. And what I had in that realization is he was now developmentally a 10 year old. So regardless of if they were in a new neighborhood or an old neighborhood, a 10 year old has the ability to make new friends. And so as we talked it through that way, she was like, Oh my gosh. Okay. You're right. And I see, (laughs) I see us as a society where we often feel like, gosh, I need to change the environment for this child to be successful, but we can't control a school environment. We can't control a work environment. So I want kids to be able to be successful in any environment. And and then in talking yeah. with Josh before the move, I asked him, what has he noticed in himself? And there's nothing better than hearing it in the words of the kids. He said, I don't annoy people anymore. I can tell when I'm being too much <laughs> and I'm able to stop. Yeah. And he said he would know before when he was being annoying, but he couldn't help it. He couldn't, he couldn't stop it. And um, he said, I, I just, I just feel stronger. And so he could yeah. handle frustrations and upsets better. He wouldn't blow up or explode or melt down for a longer period of time. He still got upset. That's normal. Yeah. That's part of life. Normal. But he was able yeah. to handle things in a more age appropriate manner. And, and, you know, fast forwarding, the family did move and it went great. And he was able to make friends in a new classroom. And so that that ability for a child to know I'm capable, to know I can make new friends, um, that I'm worthy of friendships. Yeah, um, relationships yeah. are, are so important. It's what's what brings us joy. So I was glad that there is improvement in his reading comprehension as well. But it was that the joy of his awareness of self and his ability to, to make and keep friends was the piece that that just warmed my heart and knowing that he could be successful anywhere that they didn't have to stay in the, the same neighborhood uh, was, was powerful. That is a powerful story because now someone can, as we stated earlier, can become, you know, and so here's this young man who is going to become something, you know, and he has the tools that you guys had uh, recognized that was needed and made them and the family aware of those tools. And it gave this young man a new life. And so all of you that have been listening are, are listening to us. I am so, I cannot tell you how I'm excited. Um, I am I am busting inside for uh, Dr. Jackson because of what work she does and what they do because of my uh, sons and the pressure that they, the school system was putting on us as a family to medicate our, our kids. And so I am so honored that you're here, Doc. And um, we are gonna provide everything for you guys to, get into her space. I want you to get into the online, get the books, get everything. I'm going to provide everything so that you guys could inundate her with all of it so that she can get busy uh, because I know there's an alternative to the pressure, if you will, that is provided for the ADHD. Um, and I hate to say it for this way, for that diagnosis that they had placed on us and our children and and ourselves. And so I have someone that uh, can and have a staff available to get you some help so that you can kick butt. Doc, thank you so much for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. I am so honored to have you here. It's been a pleasure, Ken. Thank you.